Welcome back, everyone, to another reaction video. We're going back to our friend Griffin, the armchair historian. He has a new video that came out, I think, about two weeks ago uh, called What Happened to Confederates After the Civil War? If you're new to the channel, the American Civil War, if I were to ascribe to myself uh, the level of expertise in a particular topic, it would be the American Civil War. It's about as close as I get in that. So this is a subject I know a lot about that I've studied for most of my life. And I'm very interested to see his take on this and exactly where he's going with this. I haven't seen it yet. Links in the description. If you haven't already checked it out, definitely check out his channel and so much more. Griffin has been a big supporter of me and what I do. Uh, and so I'm always uh, grateful for the opportunity to do a reaction to one of his videos and maybe steer a few more people his direction, though I'm guessing way more people know about his channel than will ever know about mine. So you're probably already familiar. Let's dive in. The end of the American Civil War marked a turning point in the history of the United States. While the North emerged victorious, the South was left in ruins and its people deeply divided. For former Confederate soldiers, the defeat meant grappling with a new reality. Their way of life and their cause were lost. Some chose to adapt to the new circumstances, while others clung to the past or even left the country. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and in today's video, we'll discover what happened to Confederates after the American Civil War. So I've said this before, and I'll say it again. One of the most crucial moments in American history is the immediate aftermath of the American Civil War. How we handled, how we, meaning the United States and especially the United States government, handled the aftermath of the Civil War was such a, a vital moment in time, and we botched it big time. We really, really did. Uh, and I, I mean, we as in everybody, the South botched it, the North botched it, the government botched it. it. It was such an opportunity to go in a very different direction. And so much of the next hundred plus years of um, race relations in the United States, the status of freed slaves and African Americans, particularly in the South, much of what we see going into the 50s and 60s is a direct result of how we failed to handle Reconstruction properly. Despite four years of brutal bloodshed, the end of the American Civil War was not a time of vengeance and punishment with Union troops lording over and abusing the erstwhile rebels. That's true for the most part, and uh, you see that on an individual basis. Folks like Grant, for example, after Lee's surrender at Appomattox, there are a bunch of guns going off. Union soldiers, batteries are firing guns in, like, in celebration. And, and Grant sends a message to tell him to stop. He says, listen, these guys are our countrymen again. Uh, that was very much the attitude Lincoln wanted to take. It was the attitude that Grant largely agreed with. Uh, Try to be magnanimous as possible and welcome them back. Don't go hanging everybody. There were a couple of hangings in particular. Um, there was a Confederate officer who was responsible for things like the Saltville Massacre, who ends up being hanged. Uh, Henry Verts, who is the commandant of Andersonville Prison, was hanged after the war. But for the most part, it ended up being a lot of pardons. President Abraham Lincoln ordered that surrendering Confederates be offered the most liberal and honorable terms. An order the Union's overall commander and future president, General Ulysses S. Grant, followed. When his Confederate counterpart, General Robert E. Lee, formally surrendered at Appomattox on April 9, 1865, Grant permitted all soldiers in Lee's army to keep their personal effects and horses. When the Confederates formally handed over their battle flags and weaponry three days later, Union officers were ordered to show the utmost military respect. It's, it's always fascinating to me that while General Grant had that nickname, you you know, for U.S., it was Unconditional Surrender Grant. The two most significant surrenders that he oversaw, that at Vicksburg and at Appomattox, were not unconditional surrenders. There were actually a great deal of very generous terms to the Confederates in those situations. Including saluting as both officers and rank and file surrendered their arms and standards. Now, I'm not entirely sure that was something that was directly ordered by Grant. That was more kind of at the ground level. There's a story that is most likely true, though some people debate whether it's true. But 
John Gordon, who was the Confederate general in command of the troops involved, said it happened. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain said it happened. There's this situation where uh, Chamberlain is given the task of kind of overseeing the surrender ceremony where the Confederates march past, lay down their arms in a formal surrender. Uh, and Chamberlain calls his men to attention to def to salute these fallen, the fallen South, these surrendering soldiers. And, and Gordon kind of real, you know, comes around in his horse and gives this big, like grand salute with his horse. And um, Gordon will go on to say that Chamberlain was one of the knightliest soldiers in the federal army. Uh, and Chamberlain wrote kind of very gushingly about this when it happened. Though other Confederate armies and formations would surrender in the upcoming months, the ceremonies at Appomattox mark the accepted end of the American Civil War. The war had left the southern United States devastated as scorched earth campaigns by generals like William Tecumseh Sherman gutted infrastructure and the abolition of slavery collapsed its plantation-based economy. The federal government was left debating how best to bring the rebels back into the fold, with President Lincoln desiring quick and amicable reintegration. Lincoln proposed a general amnesty for any who had taken up the Confederate cause, and that Southern states be readmitted under the political control of the Southern whites. Now, they were to be readmitted, but there were certain conditions to their readmission. One of them was um, their ratification of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, and there were other things too, but of course all of this gets upended by Lincoln's assassination. Once 10% of a given state's voters had sworn an oath of allegiance to the United States, the state would be readmitted to the Union and could reestablish its government and internal systems. It's pretty generous. This plan was rejected outright by radical Republicans, a faction of Lincoln's party that sought to punish the South for slavery, insurrection, or both. So you hear that term all the time, radical Republicans. These are the more extreme Republicans. They're going to advocate for things like harsh punishment for the Confederates, especially the generals and the political leadership. They're going to be advocating for things like equality for blacks, for especially the newly freed slaves. They're going to advocate for giving these newly freed slaves, seizing the plantations that these slaves had been forced to work and giving that property to the free, freed slaves, giving them voting rights, giving them citizenship rights, things like that. Radicals in Congress proposed their own plan, requiring a full 50% of Southern voters to swear their loyalty to the Union before their state could be readmitted. It's not a figure that could not be reached so close to the war and would have effectively prohibited the readmittance of Southern states. But Lincoln kept to his hopes, creating a legislative deadlock between him and the radical Republicans. A deadlock John Wilkes... All right, totally minor nitpick that I'm going to have here. Lincoln and his wife would have been on this side because they were with Henry Rathbone and his fiance Clara Harris, who would have been sitting in the other window. They weren't sitting this far apart. They were actually holding hands. And it's said that Lincoln's last words concerned... Uh, and a response to something his wife said about wondering what people were going to th think of him showing such public affection. Spooth broke at Ford's Theater. The death of Lincoln marked a turn in the fortunes of the former Confederates, as former slaveholder and Tennessean Andrew Johnson assumed the highest office in the land. Reconstruction, the turbulent post-war period, had begun. And I've said this before, you know that Woodrow Wilson is my least favorite president, but I don't think he was the worst president we've ever had. In terms of damage done to the country, in terms of the negative impact of his presidency, I got to go with Andrew Johnson. Southern devastation was economic and demographic. 200 to 300,000 men died while wearing the Confederate gray, a full quarter of the male population between 17 and 50. Families were left without fathers and sons, businesses without owners and workers, and political offices vacant. Those men who survived the war returned to find their home states a smoking ruin, with Union General Charles Schurz describing the site former rebels returned to 
a broad black streak of ruin and desolation. It's interesting to hear him call him Charles Schertz. Uh, I've always only ever seen it as Carl. Now, I get that Carl is the German form of Charles, and so it, it works, but I've only ever seen him named as Carl. The fences all gone, lonesome smokestacks surrounded by dark heaps of ashes and cinders, marking spots where human habitation had stood. This broad black streak, teamed with destitute refugees, masses of former slave owners, average southern people, and newly freed slaves left to contend with the physical and economic ruin. A full two-thirds of the South's wealth had been consumed by the Civil War, leaving what was once a hotbed of agrarian industry unable to even feed its population. South Carolina, the state where the war arguably started, was forced to sell 300,000 or 5.5 million in today's dollars worth of bonds just to... It didn't arguably start in South Carolina, it did start in South Carolina. No matter how you look at how it started, right? South Carolina was the first state to secede, and the first shots of the war were fired in Charleston Harbor. They start, the war started there. ...buy corn to feed its starving population. The Treasury Department did little to help the situation, with Treasury agents sweeping into the South to seize abandoned property, including stocks of the South's last major resource, cotton. Treasury agents decreed that this cotton was to be seized as war reparations. But the Now, he mentions there that one of the houses that were seized by the Treasury Department was Arlington House, uh, where Arlington National Cemetery is today. That's true, but it didn't happen after the Civil War. That happened during the war. Uh, and actually, Lee's family attempted to pay his taxes, even while they were in rebellion against the United States, even while he was leading... Uh, Confederate army in the field. They did attempt to pay their federal taxes on the property so they didn't lose it, but the government wasn't interested in that. They wanted to punish them. And so then they start Arlington Cemetery in 1864, uh, very near to the home so that Lee'd never be able to live there again. And eventually Lee's son, who inherited the property after his father's death or the rights to the property, uh, took this to court. And with the help of men such as Robert Todd Lincoln on his side, he actually won in the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, the United States was ordered to give the property back. Well, there are tens of thousands of Union soldiers and some Confederate soldiers buried on the property at that point. So he actually then sold the property back to the federal government. The men in charge of such dealings were far from honest. A system emerged in which Southern cotton owners would avoid having their stocks seized by swearing that they had never been disloyal to the United States. However, and he makes a good point here is that while we're beating up on the South for how they handle Reconstruction and they handled it awful, right? Uh, I did I did a couple of videos kind of doing a timeline walking through some of the stuff that's happening in the South, especially some of the just atrocities that are committed on newly freed slaves in the South during Reconstruction. And I'll put a link up at the end of this video for that. I never did finish that. I should go back and finish it. And it was a couple of years ago, so the quality's not as good as some of the stuff I try to do now, but at least give you the information on what was going on then. But there's mishandling of this by the North, too. There's corruption uh, in the North, there are a lot of these guys who go down to the South trying to take advantage of the economic situation. Uh, so there's, there's some pretty negative stuff going on both sides. These arrangements often involved collusion between wealthy Southerners and Treasury agents. As a result, a portion of the unseized cotton would be sold by the agents for personal profit. Although most returned to eke out a living in their ruined land, not all were willing to abide by the South's new social order or risk persecution for their participation in the war. A number of Confederate politicians fled to Europe, such as Secretary of State Judah P. Benjamin and Secretary of War John C. Breckinridge. And remember, some of these guys had been, you know, for example, John C. Breckinridge was the vice president of the United States before the Civil War. In fact, he was the vice president until March of 61. Uh, so right up, and then he's he's a general during the war. and um, So a lot of these guys, they were concerned that because of their high role and because of their former role in the federal government, that maybe they not may not be treated as leniently as the common Confederate soldier would be. Who found shelter in Britain before dying in Paris and returning home on a pardon, respectively. 
Confederate President Jefferson Davis attempted a similar escape, but was captured by Federal cavalry. Rank-and-file Confederates cast their eyes even further south, with a number settling in Mexico. And I'm glad he threw this up here, because I was going to mention this. There were rumors, and there were even cartoons and stuff in Northern papers, that Jefferson Davis was captured dressed as a woman when he was in Georgia, where they caught him. That is not the case. He was not. And he was in prison for a few years. These men reasoned that the United States would come to blows with Mexico again, and they could once more march against the Yankees. But Mexico was a nation without slavery, an institution many ex-Confederates still held close to their hearts. And as luck would have it, so did the Empire of Brazil. Sensing a new economic opportunity for his vast nation, Brazilian Emperor Dom Pedro II offered cheap farmland and sanctuary to any Confederates who settled in Brazil, intent on leveraging Southern expertise in farming cotton with local slave labor. Mm. 20,000 Confederates took Pedro up on his offer, establishing the town of Americana, roughly 260 miles from the city of Sao Paulo. The immigrants found Brazil to their liking, with one transplant musing the war-worn soldier, the bereaved parent, the oppressed patriot, the homeless and despoiled can find refuge from the trials which beset them, and a home not haunted by the eternal remembrance of harrowing scenes of sorrow and death. The citizens of Americana continue to celebrate Confederate Memorial Days and exhibit reverence for 19th century Southern culture, even as Brazil abolished slavery in 1888 and many prominent rebels, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee among them, condemned the Americana Project in their lifetimes. Yeah, that's fair to say. Listen, some guys like Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, even eventually uh, people like Uh, I'm going to just move on. I don't want to get myself into a thing that I have to argue with people about. Uh, they they were very magnanimous, I think, toward the situation after the war, right? Um, recognizing the, kind of the new world order that they lived in and not trying to perpetuate you know, this whole lost cause thing and the South will rise again and we have to hold on to... Uh, who we were before the war, that kind of stuff. There were plenty of people who did that. Lee and Longstreet and others were not among them. And there were a lot of Confederate soldiers, or, or generals as well, who ended up um, being offered roles in the military of Egypt, for example. It was these same prominent rebels that found themselves squarely in President Johnson's sights. While a general amnesty was declared for rank-and-file Confederates, an exception was made for those with property worth more than $20,000 or $370,000 in modern times. This placed wealthy planters and Confederate leadership in the position of having to specifically and publicly apply for clemency, supplicating themselves before Washington. So what, what he means by that is that if you were some random Confederate colonel, that didn't have a huge plantation or own a bunch of people before the war, you just automatically got amnesty under this blanket amnesty, and you could go back to your life with no further things to worry about. Folks like the Robert E. Lees of the world or the Nathan Bedford Forrests of the world who had vast property before the war and uh, owned a lot and, and enslaved a lot of people, um, they had to apply specifically for amnesty. Other exceptions included Confederate President Davis, yep. who was kept manacled under strict guard while the U.S. decided what to charge him with. Held him in a fort. The conditions of his imprisonment made Davis a martyr to Southerners and earned him sympathy from the Yankee public. Though Davis would never be tried for any crimes against the United States, other high-ranking Confederates There's would Henry be Burtz. indicted for treason, and one, Confederate officer Henry Wirtz, was executed for war crimes. Wasn't the only one. I'll show you the other one that I'm talking about. So here he is. His name's Champ Ferguson, and uh, he was responsible for what is known as the Saltville Massacre. Um, if you are a descendant of a Union soldier who was from eastern Kentucky during the Civil War, as I am several Union soldiers, there's a good chance that your ancestors were involved in what was called the Saltville Raid. Saltville, Virginia is in the southwestern part of the state, not far from Kentucky, and it was a one of the prominent sources of salt uh, 
uh, for the Confederate government, which was a huge need for the military. And uh, so there were a couple of raids that were made on Saltville, and one of them included some black soldiers who were wounded, left behind uh, in uh, a makeshift hospital in a university there. And Champ Ferguson and his men came in and, and massacred a bunch of wounded uh, black Union soldiers. And so after the war, uh, he was executed in Nashville at the, at the Tennessee State Prison uh, for his war crimes during, during the raid, but also from other things. Uh, and here's what he says uh, in response to the verdict. I am yet and will die a rebel. I killed a good many men, of course, but I never killed a man who I did not know was seeking my life. I'd always heard the Federals would not take me prisoner, but would shoot me down wherever they found me. That is what made me kill more than I otherwise would have done. I repeat that I die a rebel out and out, and my last request is that my body be removed to White County, Tennessee, and be buried in good rebel soil. I don't believe that that was granted. Um, here's his grave here. I don't think he was buried at home where he wanted to be, which good for him that he didn't get that. Oh, wait, he was buried in White County, Tennessee. Ah, they gave it to him. Boo, shouldn't have done it. And I should mention that specifically, he denied being responsible for killing anyone at Saltville. In Wirtz's case, for the deplorable and deadly conditions of the Andersonville prison. Yet even as his government made these shows of force, Johnson followed many of Lincoln's ideas for Reconstruction, to the point of being more lenient in readmitting states. Johnson declared that North Carolina could reapply for admission when its citizens had written a new state constitution and formed a government loyal to the United States, eliminating the requirements for oaths of allegiance. This set a precedent, and the unrestored states rushed to meet these terms themselves in hopes of rejoining the Union without federal interference. And many former Confederate luminaries would use their state's readmission as a ticket back to political power. Yep. All in all, the former vice president of the Confederacy, four Confederate generals, five Confederate colonels, six Confederate cabinet officers, and 58 Confederate congressmen went to Washington thanks to the 1865 election. Yeah, this is a great point that really goes unnoticed a lot of the time is that so many of these prominent Confederates ended up in Congress, ended up senators, ended up governors in the post-war world, which is such a fascinating thing that people could actively lead a rebellion against the government and then end up back in that government in their later life. Across the South, candidates for official positions often had late of the Confederacy printed on their tickets to solicit support for their election. Some of those elected proudly wore their uniforms to their state's legislative sessions. However, Southerners would join the government to promote unity and reconstruction, such as noted Confederate General James Longstreet. Longstreet was initially indicted for treason, but his case was dismissed at the insistence of Union General Grant. Writing in a New Orleans paper regarding Reconstruction, he stated that the war was made upon Republican issues, and it seems to me fair and just that the settlement should be made accordingly. Longstreet was present for Grant's wedding to uh, Julia Dent, who was a relative, a cousin of James Longstreet. Longstreet and Grant went to West Point together. They were friends. Longstreet eventually will end up serving as the U.S. ambassador to Turkey, to the Ottoman Empire, I guess you should, I should say, uh, and becomes a Republican after the war, which did not sit well with a lot of the former Confederates. Longstreet would go on to join the Republican Party, promoting Reconstruction and criticizing his former commander, Robert E. Lee, at any opportunity. His position on Reconstruction was deemed treacherous by most Southerners. White Southerners, regardless of their feelings on Reconstruction, could not tolerate the sight of their land being occupied by federal troops, many of whom were black. They bristled at this, seeing the Federals as invaders and the presence of black soldiers as a calculated insult. In reality, the quick establishment of state governments under Johnson's presidency meant actual troop numbers in the South were small, and they dwindled rapidly with each year of Reconstruction. Yeah. But racism was not limited to being insulted at the presence of black troops. So yeah, in the North, public opinion, the longer you get from the end of the, the Civil War, public opinion starts to turn more and more against Reconstruction, and that's one of the main problems. 
And a lot of people talk about the 1876 election, which I'm sure he'll get to between Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes, and that Hayes made this bargain to pull the, the remaining federal troops out of the South in exchange for getting the election in his favor. Honestly, that had way less of an impact than people want to give credit for. First of all, Tilden would have pulled those troops out too if he had been given the election. And public opinion was so far against Reconstruction at that point that Hayes would have been pretty ineffective in keeping it going anyway. Slavery may have legally been over, but the South sought to maintain white supremacy in every facet Absolutely. of life. While Southerners' fear for their position was existential, Reconstruction meant voting rights for black people, a prospect the former Confederates saw as little more than a ploy to create one-party Republican rule. As states were reorganized, legislators pushed to pass black codes that granted black citizens basic rights on paper, but in reality placed so many restrictions and caveats on them that black Southerners were reduced to near slave status. And black citizens name. were compelled to enter into paid labor contracts that put them into indentured servitude to whoever employed them. Yeah, you basically, you're signing a contract that makes you a slave in all but name. You couldn't end the contract early. You couldn't leave from that job. And the contract could be sold to someone else. The contract was you. With individuals empowered to arrest and return any black employee who left their job before their contract expired. Enslavement. That's what it The was. federal government saw these acts as an attempt to revive slavery in all but name. Yep. Something unacceptable to the Republican-controlled Congress. In order to stave off attempts at reintroducing slavery in a new guise, the federal government had created the Freedmen's Bureau. While this agency was set up short- Listen, for all you want to say about Oliver Howard as a general, and he had some pretty rough moments at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, solid dude. Really was a solid dude. He's the namesake of Howard University, a champion of the civil rights for the freed slaves, and shows that by leading the Freedmen's Bureau. A really good guy shortly prior to the end of the war to assist refugees and displaced persons of all races, it was intended to assist recently freed slaves in particular. The Bureau set up schools and hospitals, mediated labor negotiations between businesses and emancipated workers, and held confiscated land to be parceled out as 40 acres and a mule. President Johnson, however, pressured the Bureau to return confiscated lands to their original Confederate owners, with freedmen receiving little land of their own. The Bureau was more successful in establishing schools and hospitals, treating hundreds of thousands of patients, and educating many first-generation students. However, these acts ran contrary to former Confederate values, and the recently reconstituted state governments made it clear that the Bureau had no real authority in their borders. Former Confederates saw the Bureau as virtually a foreign government forced upon them and supported by an army of occupation, while others declared it an enemy of Southern sovereignty. So you see, even in the mindset of many of these people, though they had lost the war, in their minds they're still doing everything they can to be a separate country. And in many ways they were successful in that. President Johnson soon came out as an enemy of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1866, vetoing an extension to its funding and essentially shutting the organization down. Former Confederates soon began enforcing the Black Codes through ad hoc violence, with yep. some of these bandit gangs growing so powerful that federal troops had to meet them in pitched battle. These protective societies enjoyed immense public support, to the point that one such collective, the Ku Klux Klan, became a national scourge with the election of former Confederate raider Nathan Bedford Forrest as its supreme leader. The KKK determined that the ad hoc attacks were not enough. Southern blacks had to be reminded of their place through terror. An epidemic. And it, Ulysses S. Grant will go on to uh, his government will create the Justice Department in large part to put down the Klan, and they pretty much eliminated the Klan as an effective organization. It only came back under you know who epidemic of violence erupted, with lynchings of black people and white northerners, voter intimidation, and public displays of grim pageantry used to deliver a simple message. We, the white southerners, are still in charge, and it will- And if you want to see a movie that has a lot of flaws, but I think does a good job in portraying 
what things were like for these people in the post-war South. Uh, the Free State of Jones with Matthew McConaughey does a good job of portraying that part of things. We'll stay that way. Although the federal government passed laws targeting the KKK and sent troops into southern states to root them out, former Confederate soldiers had succeeded in their goals of regaining political power and reestablishing the social mores of the Old South. With the end of Reconstruction and the withdrawal of federal troops, they were able to rebuild their communities and institutions nearly as they had been before the war. The impact of their efforts continue to mark American social and political disputes to this day. Such an opportunity wasted and, uh, you know, in hindsight, should have come down hard on the South. Maybe things would have been different. But unfortunately, we have the world we have and we can just make the best of it now. So thanks for watching. I hope that gave you something to think about. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. We'll see you again soon.